Welcome everyone. This is Coaching in Session. My name is Michael Reardon and I will be your mindset coach today. And today we're going to be talking about women's health and wellness with a guest. And she's going to be helping us understand all the different things that could be going on in a woman's life. What can be stopping her from maybe, you know, finding her power, getting to the weight that she wants, the goals that she wants to reach and attain in life. There could be many different factors. But then we do have to look at the whole societal thing too. They might be pushing you this way. They might be pushing you that way, which is the right way. Oftentimes we might, you know, follow with our peers, especially like in high school, we become accustomed to doing what is normal. But then we do have to inquire, well, what will we like? What will we like to be normal for us? Would struggle, would unhappiness, would that type of normal light you up, brighten your day? Oftentimes it's not. And it's in those moments when people decide, they say, you know what? I had enough of this. I want to make some changes. And the one thing that I can, you know, attest to this uh, episode is that we have such a warm, light, and loving conversation. That right there is going to be a huge proponent, a huge factor in helping people understand that the way that we can do it is with a helping hand, a kind heart, and a mind that's focused on making good changes. And the good can be, you know, defined by you, similar to how success is defined by you. Happiness can be defined by you too. So we're going to be looking at all the nuances that can happen in our life and then putting it into one package and then delivering it to you in a way that you are going to want to take action And we're going to be doing that with my guest, Michelle Stiff. Welcome, Michelle Stiff, to Coaching in Session. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, today I have you on as a women's health and wellness coach. And I am no expert in this field. And that is why I have you on. We're going to be talking about what is going on with the ladies in the world today. In your own words, tell the world who you are, what you do, and how you help. Yes. Well, so I am, like you said, a women's health and fitness coach, but really focusing on female hormones and metabolism. And that journey kind of started for me because I think most of us as women who struggle with our weight, which for me, I always struggled from a very young age was we are told if we want to lose weight, we need to just move more and eat less. And I actually, I do have a background as a personal trainer and a nutritionist. And even with that background, I drove myself into the ground and I didn't realize the hormonal repercussions from doing too much. And, you know, you think exercise is good for you. So do more is better. And it more is sometimes just more. Through that process, I was actually only 28 at the time, and I kind of put myself into an early menopause due to all of the stress, overworking out, under eating, and I had no clue. And I spent thousands of dollars going, I actually lived in Africa at the time. I was born and raised in Africa, but I am American. And we were living in Africa at the time. I kept coming back to the States for further testing and going to endocrinologists, and no one could figure out what was wrong with me. So I started really studying about the female hormones and metabolism. Because like you said, you're not an expert because men, we have fewer hormones that can kind of go wonky than than we do as women. And uh, so when I discovered this, I, I really found out that I was doing a lot of things wrong and started to work on healing my hormones and metabolism so that I could ultimately get pregnant. And that's kind of what started this journey. And I see it time and time again. I don't know if you you hear from women probably who are on that yo-yo diet roller coaster for a very, very long time. And that's actually doing a lot of damage to our female body. Well, let's start to dissect it because you are, just from looking at you, it seems like you are in great shape right now. And you said you did struggle with losing weight, I believe, early on. What were some of the things that you began to implement? Was it because I knew you said you really did a lot of like working out and things like that and it was causing a lot of stress. But what were some of the right things you did to get someone or to get on track and then how you help people get on track? Yeah, such a good question. And so really, we have to take a holistic look at our life. So in terms of our metabolism, we look with our coaching clients at so much more than just their diet and exercise. We're looking at their sleep, their mood, their hunger, their energy, their cravings, their digestion, their libido. 
So when those things are out of whack or out of check, I call them, is your SMEC in check is the acronym I use for sleep, hunger, um, energy, cravings. Um, is your SMEC in check? And if it's out of check, we know that things are out of balance with the body. When I started to look at my lifestyle, the stress, my lack of sleep, my over-exercising, I really started to pull it back, taking more time to rest, to prioritize sleep, to prioritize recovery. I did a lot of cardio at that time as well. I I have a background in teaching step aerobics and things like that. I would go running. I would do step. It was a ton of and hit training, things like that. So I dialed all of that back. I did more strength training, yoga and Pilates in the in-between to restore and then walking instead of always going out and hammering my body. Because exercise is a stress. It can be a good stress. But again, if we're overdoing it in relation to the amount of recovery we have, that's going to be a problem. And then I really started to optimize. I was doing very low carb at the time, which again, for some women can be okay, but that can have hormonal implications, especially for our thyroid and down-regulating our metabolism and also our brain, right? We, need, we actually need glucose as a preferred energy source for our brain too. And I was very, very low carb at that time. So adding in slowly more carbs, kind of dialing back the exercise, prioritizing rest and recovery. And now I also teach women how to do that in alignment with their hormones and their menstrual cycle. If they, they have a menstrual cycle, we do that for the weeks of the cycle. And if they're post-menopause, we can kind of still do it in alignment with either the moon cycle or just kind of where their own body is at in terms of having certain symptoms at certain times of the month, if that makes sense. There's a statistic, I'm not sure if you read it or heard about it. They say by the year 2030, women over the age of 40, I believe, I believe it's 40, not 30. I could be uh, mixed up. So it could be 30 or 40. They say 45% of, of women over the age of, of 40, I believe, is going to be overweight. Do you think that statistic is correct? And uh, they were talking mainly about in the US or worldwide? In the US, yes, in the US. I would say, I mean, likely that that could be the case. We're definitely, we're getting bigger over time in, in our society. And I think a lot of it has to do with the amounts of stress that our society is under, but also the nutrient density of a lot of the foods that we're eating, right? There's a lot more prepackaged and processed foods now. Even the nutrient density of foods because of soil fertility has decreased now. Even when we're eating whole natural foods, because of that soil depletion, they're not as nutrient dense as things that we used to be able to eat, you know, even 100 years ago. But I think that it's a lot of things. It's us burning the candle at both ends. You know, so many of the women I talk to are sleeping four or five hours a night, which just that alone can cause insulin resistance, but from the lack of sleep. So more and more stress in our society, I think, is causing this global obesity problem. Well, where is this stress coming from? I know when we look at wellness as a whole, it's more than just the foods we eat, because if we're not looking at the stressors in our life, then we're going to be missing a big proponent of being well. What would you say are some of the greatest stressors that women are facing in the world today? Yeah, and I think, you know, obviously it depends on the woman, but there's a, a lot of pressure on us. I know I'm a mom of two small boys at this point and a business owner and trying to juggle all these different hats and being pulled in a million different directions. We have to-do lists that are miles long. It's never ending. And we are always on like the click of a button. I've got a lot of clients. I manage a whole team of coaches. We've got, you know, six coaches on my team. I have a team of 10 women I'm managing. And I literally could be on my phone all the time and be plugged in. And I think having intentional time where I am not on my phone and I'm just being present with my kids and taking down time, but it's really hard, right? In the back of your mind, sometimes there's that chatter of all the things that we should be doing. For me, one thing that's really helped has time blocking so that everything has a space, even hanging out with my kids, spending time with my husband or whatever has a slot so that I don't feel guilty when I'm doing that thing. It's like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing and trying to be a bit more present and in the moment because for me, I had a background with a lot of anxiety postpartum. I had insomnia. And really, whenever we're that worried and anxious, it's because we're not in the present moment, right? The past is already gone and the future actually doesn't exist because when tomorrow comes, it's the now, right? And so for me, it became just training my brain to not worry about all those things because there are a million different ways it could turn out. 
that my brain is going into overdrive and just being like in the now, what do I need to do right now? Trying to be present and not take for granted. I think anytime we can get into gratitude for what we do have, instead of all the things that we don't have or the things that are going wrong, we literally can't be in a place of anxiety and gratitude at the same time. Our brain doesn't work that way. So when we can, I try to wake up every morning with a morning kind of ritual that I have that is gratitude, intentions for the day. I do some EFT tapping, which I don't know if you know what that is, emotional freedom techniques, just to kind of calm myself down. And those have made such a big difference in my own stress. And I even taught my son who he had some anxiety and he's seven and he even knows how to tap now. And I think that when we can take care of ourselves the best we can, it's going to have that ripple effect on those around us. Like when you win, who else wins as well? Yeah, very true. One of the things I love about the podcast and about the work I do is I get to talk to, uh, to all these different types of coaches and, and they all have a different method and a different strategy. When I onboard individuals, because I'm a mindset coach, I do life coaching, stuff like that. There's a process that I follow, but I think it's always important for individuals, listeners to know your process, because I believe it brings a connection and it gives them a bit of, I guess you can say, not a forewarning, but like they know ahead of time, okay, this is where I'm going to get, I'm going to be cared for, I'm going to be spoken with, not talked to, and it creates a connection early on. I want to talk about your process and how you would talk to someone who's a new client, someone, you know, trying to get their life on track. How would you approach that? Yeah, absolutely. And before I ever kind of offer anyone a spot on our roster to have one-on-one -on -one coaching, I always get on a discovery call first. So we can really talk about their challenges, their goals, what's been keeping them stuck on a deeper level. And I know that, again, the work you do is amazing. And the mindset piece is the foundation, I believe, for anything in life that we want to accomplish. And I think we're only scratching the surface, really, of what the brain is capable of, right? We're going to find out more and more down the road, wouldn't you say, with really how amazing the human brain is. And we're only using a small fraction of what it's really capable of. Whenever I'm doing a discovery call like that, we're trying to get to the root cause of what is keeping someone stuck. And it is so often their mindset, right? Once we can strategize and really map out what are the things they've done before, what worked well, what didn't, what is the vision that they really want to create? Because it's about so much more than just being smaller, fitting into smaller clothes or, you know, being a certain weight. It's about what does that give you? back in your life? How is that the launch pad for you to be able to achieve so much more in your life? What is that giving you? Is it things you're able to do or experiences that you're able to have with your family or you're in a better mood? Women's libido increases, all these amazing things that increase in their life when they're taking better care of themselves. But that looks different for every woman. So, you know, some of the women that come into my program, and I've had clients who are in their 70s. And then I've got clients who are in their early 30s with very young kids, right? So we really have to map out what their lifestyle, what their habits look like, what are their stresses before we customize a plan. Because again, every person's background, their metabolism, their hormones, their traumas that they have had in their life is going to kind of dictate how we need to approach things. And that's on a case by case basis. I don't believe in any cookie cutter plans that it all has to be based on that person and their starting point. So if I have someone who's really advanced at working out and knows a lot about nutrition and is single and can kind of focus on herself, it's going to look very different than a busy mom of, with little kids who has no idea about any of those things. So that's kind of, we have to customize it. Yeah, I'm definitely not a fan of cookie cutter approaches either. And if you look at the school system as a cookie cutter approach, if you think about it, 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 you put a classroom of 30 kids who teach them the same thing. There is no way that all 30 kids are going to learn and operate in the same way. Is it, there is no way that's going to happen. And if it does, you handpick these kids and that doesn't happen in the public schools. It might happen like in a Montessori school, but even that is rare. I do want to talk about something where you're asking them the things that they want, right? The things that make them feel powerful. And... One of the things, maybe the biggest issue, I believe, when it comes to women's health today is that they are going off what someone else wants for them or what the world wants for them or what society wants for them. And they don't do the work to say, well, what do I want? And it looks good, right? Because everyone else, you know, says, oh, you need this, you need this. 
Think of the American dream. You need this big house. You need a dog or a cat. You need some kids, a husband, wife, or whatever, right? They tell you everything you need, but did you ask yourself, do you want that? There are people who don't like pets. There's people who don't want kids. There's people who don't want to be married. We have this dilemma now where we have to ask ourselves that question, what do I want? And oftentimes when I speak, you know, like new clients, whether it be career, health, whatever, right? I go, okay, well, what are your passions, right? What do you want from this? You know, what do you want to change? They're like, well, you know, I haven't gave that much thought. Why are we not giving attention to this? So true, because how are we ever going to know that we've arrived there if we don't know what there is, right? So I actually, part of our onboarding process is what we call the miracle scale. And it's really a way of delineating certain milestones along the way. So often women come in and they have this vision of what their 10 is, right? Whether it's to fit in a certain size clothing or what they're going to look like or their muscle tone or whatever it is, they have this idea of like the 10, which, okay, fine, we have that. But if we if we think that we're at a one or a two, the idea of trying to get to this 10 can feel so far away and c completely unmanageable. And then it's not that they're not having success, but they haven't delineated these mile markers along the way to celebrate the success on the way, on the journey. So what we do is really establish like, well, what will it look like when you're at a five? How are you going to know that you're now at a five? You've moved from a two to a three to a four. Now you're at a five, right? So we actually have them map out what that's going to look like so that they know they've moved up one ladder on that miracle scale. And then it chunks it down. It makes it a lot more manageable. And they're able to celebrate all of those victories along the way. And I say there are no small wins. They're just wins. Because every win you have is going to compound and you're going to build more and more momentum. And you're going to step into that highest version of you. Like we're all trying to elevate to get on an identity level to become that person that we're striving to be. That's about so much more than just changing our environment or our habits. It's really embodying that person. And once they can see that and celebrate the success, I've seen so many women who would have given up if they hadn't had that, those milestones along the way that we're celebrating, those non-scale victories, their mindset shifts, all of that. Most women give up before they, or I would say right before they're about to have a breakthrough and a massive transformation, they give up because they haven't celebrated all those successes along the way. Or they could achieve that end result but really not have changed anything internally. So they're going to resort back to that old person. And they're probably going to regain the weight and end up right back where they started. And you've probably seen that as well, like in your life a lot. I think for us, it's celebrating everything, the journey, not just the end destination, but the process and who we're becoming. I want to talk about beauty now. Beauty is a standard that societies might give maybe an individual might give themselves a standard of beauty. They have to wear maybe makeup, get surgeries, things along those lines that so look a certain way. And we can look at the rise of surgeries in women today, whether it be fillers, uh, Botox and stuff like that. Surgeries, there's different types of that. So, so just think of the gambit of weight surgeries. And I want to talk about the the long-term effects of doing this, because we can do it naturally or we can do it scientifically. Like, I'm not sure of the correct terminology to uh, do that, but I do want to have a correlation to the quick fix and then working hard to attain it. I have found that if you work hard to attain something, number one, you appreciate it more, and then you're going to be able to sustain it more readily. Versus if something happened very quickly, think of if someone won the lotto, right? You know, this is, I, I know it's not health and fitness, but if someone gets something very quickly, they're more likely to lose it. So if they lose all the weight because of a surgery, and unless the surgery is going to inhibit them from eating more or something, they're going to gain that weight back. And it's because they're not learning effective habits and methods. So I want to pass that to you. Like, do you think this is a good thing, a bad thing? And if it's either or, do we have to make any adjustments? That's such a good question. And there's a phenomenal book. And I think it was written actually in the 70s. And I need to go back. It's called Psycho Cybernetics. Have you ever heard of this book? I have not. I'm going to. I'm gonna it's really it good. And so he's a, a plastic surgeon and he actually looks at that. So basically what he found in those surgeries that he was doing for people was that there was a certain subset of people who once they had these surgeries done and they changed their appearance, they literally adopted a new identity and it changed their life, right? And then there was a certain subset of people that it was the opposite. 
that they literally looked different physically, but when they looked in the mirror, they were still seeing them their old self, like nothing had changed. And those are the people, and you see celebrities and people like that who become addicted to these surgeries. And they, and I, I remember like everyone loves friends, right? And like Courtney Cox, at one point, she said she didn't even recognize herself because she kept layering and layering and layering and doing more and more work until she looked in the mirror and she was like, who am I? I don't even look like me anymore, right? But I think, again, it comes down to that identity level. These people that changed their exterior and changed their life was because all of a sudden they had the confidence to step out as a different version of themselves. And maybe they were able to let go whether or not it's like they had a big nose that they had a surgery on or whatever they perceived as their flaws. And maybe they were teased about it and had traumas or whatever. But then when they were able to let that go and step into this new identity, it literally changed everything. Whereas there were some people that, again, they still stayed attached to their old identity and how they used to look and it didn't change anything in their lives. I think ultimately, if we're not doing that deep inner work, we're never going to find that fulfillment. There's always going to be something else that we would like want to fixate on to change. Someone else is always going to be prettier, smarter, have more money, whatever, more success than we have. There's always someone else out there. I think if we are comparing to others, it really is that thief of joy. We're never going to be fully happy. If we can't just do that deep, deep inner work and become okay with ourselves, it's hard, right? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, no, it's extremely difficult. And this is reminiscent. I wrote a book. It's called Almost Happy. And it's, it's all akin to this. The book is not out yet. It will be out. But I don't have the exact date. But when the book is out, it's going to be talking about how we chase happiness. And happiness can be in the form of anything. It, it could be food. It could be money. It could be relationships. And we think that always... The next thing is going to be the best thing. I want to talk about right now, starting where we are. How can we appreciate ourselves today if we want to change tomorrow? I still think it comes back to, like I said, an attitude of gratitude for the things that we do have. So there's a part of our brain called the reticular activation system, and it's kind of like a goal-seeking missile, right? And I know that you with your mindset work probably talk about this quite a lot. And it is something that we can use and really leverage for good, or we can use it in a negative way. And it's kind of the, I know that this is an overused analogy, but it's kind of like when we get a new car that maybe we've never really noticed before. And all of a sudden, everyone's driving our car and we see it everywhere. And it's not because all of a sudden everyone has the same car that we do. It's just that our brain is now switched on and clocked into that car. And it's now noticing it because it's essentially like filtration system, right? And so once we can start to train our brain to seek out all the good things, the, the gratitude that we have for the things that we do have, the things that are going well, our brain is going to start to seek out more of it rather than the opposite. And there are studies done that it's like for every three positive thoughts that we have, one negative will just cancel it out. So we need, we really need to be seeking out more of those positive things. And the more, again, we seek, we will find it, right? By the same token, once you, it's just like with your partner or friends or whatever, if there's one thing that annoys you, then you're going to start to like nitpick on all the things that are annoying you versus like, how about I find the things that I actually love and appreciate about you, right? And that can be such a life-changing thing. Again, instead of what you don't have, what do you have and how can you grow and expand on that? Because what you focus on does expand. We do have to look at the power of the mind, though, because the biggest excuse or the most consistent excuse across the board is I just don't have time. I'm so busy, right? You are a business owner. You, you know, time can be a constraint. And I know you schedule things and you have boxes for things. But most people, they just kind of give themselves a blanket excuse of I don't have time to get in shape. I don't have time to eat healthy. I don't have time to focus on me because I'm so busy doing everything else. How can we start to get rid of the excuses in our life and start to look at the areas that we need to enhance ourselves so that later on we can be proud and not feel guilty, as you said early on, for doing these different things? I love spending time with my kid. And, and if I have a box scheduled for work, I don't mind leaving it because I understand, for me at least. Yeah. He wins. He's superior. Absolutely. My, you know, my family wins. And I mean, even when my wife gave birth a month early, I had meetings lined up. It was crazy how many meetings I had of like tens of thousands of dollars all gone. And it was because I had to make a choice at some level. We do have to make a choice and we can say we don't have time. We can say that we don't have the knowledge. We can say that um, we tried and we failed. But 
you know, there's something else that is going to push us on to, you know, reach to those goals. Well, I say to my clients too, we can either have the reasons or we can have the result, right? And I think that ultimately, even with like my business and what I set out to do, it was like, I can make all of those reasons and use that literally and keep on saying those same things over and over again, or I can do things differently and to get a different result. And I think that ultimately you nailed it. What are the priorities? For me, there's nothing more important than my kids and my family. Absolutely. Like you said, you dropped everything to be there with your wife and newborn baby, right? So we have to figure out if we're not making ourselves a priority though, and I, again, a, an overused analogy, but I think it's so apt here is that if we don't put on our oxygen mask on for us, like they say on the plane, we're not going to be able to help anyone else if we're passed out. And so many moms, uh, they are down here on that priority list. Everyone becomes first. But because of that, because they're not happy, because they have no energy, they're depleted, they're doing everything for everyone else, they are being affected by it. And when I went through my anxiety and my insomnia, I wasn't showing up as the best mom and wife. I was a zombie. I felt miserable right? I wasn't enjoying my life at all. And if I didn't reach out and get help and get coaching, I don't know where I would be today. I don't think I would have a business. I think trying to go at it alone, I believe in having coaching, having community and support is so, so important. Even though you can know what to do, but you get in your own way. We self-sabotage because our brain is always trying to keep us safe. It's always looking for the easiest way out. It's a defense mechanism, survival mechanism that is in place, right? Is to do the, the path of least resistance. But like you said, anything that's worth it in life takes work. Easy is earned. My, one of my mentors, Jay Tita, he says easy is earned. And I think it's so important to look at that. Sometimes we can see other people have had all the success and be like, it's just so easy for them. But we don't know the hours that they've spent into crafting their trade, into honing their skills, the effort that they've put into things, right? And it's that much more worth it when you've had to work to achieve it. And when you prioritize yourself, who else benefits from that? And I guarantee it's not just you. I think everyone else. Time, we all have the 24 hours. Workouts don't have to take a lot of time. 20, 30 minutes workout three times a week. Great for your health. We all know that we waste that time doing other mindless stuff or scrolling social media. My meals that I prepare for my family, they're 15, 20 minute meals. They're not gourmet anything. They're basic. They get it done, my kids eat it, and we move on. So I think that there are ways of slotting this into a busy lifestyle that very easy and ultimately helps you be healthy and have more energy to do more in your life. Yeah, and and we do have to look at filling our cup first in, in a sense, because then at some point it's going to be overflowing and then everyone around us is going to be able to fill their cups too. But when we empty our cup, there's gonna be nothing in there for anyone else. And then even for ourselves, and if we are not our best self, or we are not in a position where we're good, then how can we start to help people also? Looking at the idea of coaching, it's looking at all the potential that a person has, and then just saying, okay, well, you know, now we know what you want. We have some direction. Let's start walking there together. And it's maybe the most scariest thing a person can do, putting themselves out there. Many people don't want to fail, but fail, you know, but Failure is going to be the stepping stones for many successes in, in your future. We do have to go through those hurdles and we do have to learn ourselves more. And I have found the best way is to have a coach, a guide, a mentor, someone there to hold you accountable, to show you your blind spots and to make it transparent. Hey, we just talked about what you wanted. This is what you're doing. If you're self-sabotaging, we're going to call you out on it. And from there, you're like, oh, yeah, you're right. Because we're not there to pick on you. We're not there to yell or ridicule you. We're there to help you. And typically when we build those relationships, and that's why cookie cutter programs don't work, because we're building the connection. And once the connection is there, it doesn't matter if I say it in a maybe a like a very abrasive way, or I say it in a very sweet and caring way. So I call it sugar and spice, whether it be sugar or spicy, you understand I'm coming from a good place versus a place of like, oh, he's picking at me or she's picking at me. No, I see that you can win. I know you can win. Why are you not doing the things that are helping you win? And that is the wonders of coaching. And that's why I love having other wonderful coaches like you come on, talk about your work, and then to instill that in more people in the world. So as we begin to wrap up, I would love to get some final words and then for you to tell the artists where they can find you. Yeah, absolutely. I love everything that you've just said there. And and really, when we can get down again to the reasons why people are self-sabotaging, because there is always a secondary gain for that. 
it, there's a benefit when we do that. You know, it's kind of misguided self-love. So when we can flip that script into something that's actually going to propel you forward, like you said, it has to be custom depending on the individual and what their unique struggles are then we're, we can really break down those barriers and achieve so much more than we even thought was possible. And sometimes it's borrowing the belief from a coach who knows and can really push you to hold yourself to that higher standard. Love everything that you've just said there. And yes, I am just so honored to be here. So they can find me on Instagram at Michelle Stiff underscore wellness. And also I'm, I'm on TikTok. I also have a private Facebook community that I do a lot of free trainings and you know, workouts and nutrition tips and recipes and all of that, that women can join. And I even have a little gift that is really how to harness their own hormones and learn about what we've talked about today a little bit with the different phases and really kind of crack their own code because every woman is different. But I do have that as a free gift that we can also share with the audience if they want to download that. Perfect. And I'll make it easy for everyone. All the links are going to be in the description box below so people can easily check you out on Instagram, follow you, learn more about what you're doing, join your Facebook group. It is private, so they have to wait for that acceptance invite. But once you get accepted, then that is going to be the key to that locked door that you might be uh, looking at right now. And from there, you can begin to enhance yourself little by little. It doesn't have to be big steps. We have to be incremental sometimes to a better us. And if we can give ourselves the attention and the focus of the results we want instead of the reasons and the excuses as we were talking about, we're going to be in a better place. Not very long, too. So I want to thank you so much, Michelle Stiff, for coming on, talking about your work and being a wonderful guest. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching that interview with my guest, Michelle Stiff. As you can see, what went on in that interview is we had a lovely conversation about all the nuances of what can happen in a woman's health and the wellness and her fitness journey. It's going to be different for everyone, as we talked about. What works for someone might not work for someone else. So we can't necessarily say, well, this is peer reviewed and this is what my friend did, what my mom did. It could help. But we do need to look at what do we need to do? What do we need to adjust? When we say we, we're in this together. If you come into coaching a session, we do this because we don't necessarily say, well, you're by yourself. You're on team A. I'm on team B. We're going against each other. This is a rivalry. No, no, no. This is a unity. How can I help you and how can you help the world? That is basically the mission. You being in a better place helps more people. Me doing this hopefully can help you that you can change if you want to. Change is going to be only if you want it. If you look in the mirror and you say, I'm perfectly content with who I am, that's fine. But if you look in the mirror and you say, I want to make some changes, I want to adjust how I'm living. Maybe it can be even mindset. I want to adjust how I'm thinking. My mind is not in a good place. Are you paying attention? There's one of the wonderful things I like to give myself on a daily, consistent basis. And is if something goes on. It can happen to my kids. It can happen with my clients. It can happen with, uh, you know, family members. Am I paying attention when it matters the most? Because especially if you have young kids, they're looking at you. They're learning whether you're taking action or if you're not taking action. You're sitting on the sofa, being on the phone, they're learning. What can we do to, I guess you can say, excite ourselves to take the action that we know we can, maybe the actions that we want to, maybe we're a bit afraid to do it. Maybe we don't have the direction quite yet. We're not 100% certain. So we give ourselves this idea. And this idea is going to be this grandiose vision that we have for ourselves and our future. But we always put it on a back burner. We wait for a later date. The time is not perfect right now, right? It's not the perfect time. I'll do it when. However, if you began to make some changes today, what would happen in your life? What type of good would come about everything? Would you have a better career, a more fulfilling relationship with your spouse or your children or your family? There could be many things that cause you to think in a certain way. There can be only one thing that causes you to change. You. What do you want? 
What do you want? Truly, what do you want? And this is not about a guy asking, you know, their wife or their girlfriend, what do you want to eat? And it's like, oh, whatever, right? We're not looking at that aspect, right? Because again, we're looking at what do you truly want at the end of it? Because we can fast forward until you're 65. Do you want to be living on the street? No, right? Like that's an easy no. Do you want to be happy? Yeah, I'm sure you do. Do you want to be healthy? I, I'm almost certain you do. Do you want to have some type of fulfillment? What does that look like? Would it be family, career? What does that look like to you, right? We look at all the different nuances of our future, but sometimes we get stuck right now. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't live in the moment. The moment's the most powerful moment we got or the most powerful time we got because we are able to do something right now. And I encourage everyone to take this moment, to use this opportunity to begin to implement some changes in their life. It could be a phone call with Michelle, a discovery session. Why not give her a call? Send her a message on Instagram. Begin the conversation. Because from there, we can start to, I guess you can say, peel back all the layers of the onions trying to get to the center or all the layers of what's going on in our life, trying to get to the root of what we need to work on and what we need to give some attention toward. It's not so much that we're broken. It's that we have the potential to be so much better than what we are right now. And it's not about being perfect either. I have a blog and a a podcast episode on the art of perfectionism. We can give ourselves of this idea of being perfect, but it's about being perfectly imperfect. I know I'm not perfect. Heck, I don't want to be perfect. You know how much stress that would cause just to be perfect all the time, to make sure you don't make any mistakes? If I make a mistake, I welcome it because I understand I'm human, that this is life. We need the good, we need the bad, so we can mix them together and appreciate it. Because if we only had good in our life, how can we understand what we have as good? And if we only had bad in our life, we will always yearn for the good, but it would be difficult to take the action because we will feel that this bad or you know this circumstance that we're living in is our forever situation. But today, I'm here to tell you that it's not your forever situation. It is going to be a wake-up call perhaps for you. If you have changed, whether it be body or mind, you can make some changes to get yourself where you want to be. It might not be an easy road. It might be challenging. There might be some pitfalls along the way, but that makes you a stronger person. I would rather have a warrior beside me, a fighter that has gone through battle with armor that's full of nicks and chips and dents and all of these different things that can go wrong with armor than someone who has a pristine set of armor. Battered and bruised can be a badge of honor, but then we have to understand we don't stay in those moments of defeat or those moments of hardships. We give ourselves a reason to focus. We give ourselves the potential that we can earn the life that we want, but it's not going to be given to us all the time. We have to reach out and we have to grab it. We have to ask for it. One of the best ways to ask is again, check out the links in the description box below. Send us a message, whether it be Michelle or us here at Reverend Concepts. We'll be more than happy to help you along that way on that journey to the you that you're waiting to see. My name is Michael Reardon. I'm a mindset coach. If you have any questions, email me session at gmail.com and I'll see everyone on the next episode of Coaching in Session. Until then, everyone take care.